Okay, so we can start. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, so early and cup of coffee. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, so this talk will be, uh, this seminar will be given by uh, Randa Verification and Microsoft. You should then finish from Microsoft. And uh, we try to give you a broad overview of what you can do with formal verification. And then we'll dive a bit into our own uh, techniques and approaches. <coughs> but to set a mood for the, for the seminar, let me start with a famous quote by a uh, famous person, Daisra, who said that program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs, but never to show their absence. Okay, so what that is telling us is that while testing is very useful, we cannot rely entirely on just testing if what we really want is to prove correctness of our, of our uh, um, um, program. To prove correctness, we need formal methods, which are mathematically grounded techniques to model and reason about, about the system. <coughs> and um, before we dive deeper into formal methods, um, I'd like to also see another quote by another famous uh, person, Tony Ward. Both Tony Ward and, and, and Dijkstra got the Turing Award, which is the best award you can get in computer science. And he said that the job of formal method is to elucidate the assumptions upon which formal correctness depends. Right, so if somebody tells you that, hey, I formally verified or I formally modeled my system, what that really means, or what that should mean, is that they clarify all the assumptions under which the property they claim in the code. So this is an overview of our presentation today. Um, we are going to give an overview of formal verification, and then we'll dive deeper into our approach based on the case framework. Then we'll show you some examples of how we formally verify smart contracts. Um, um, and uh, we'll use three different approaches that uh, we want to put together under one umbrella. And then we'll conclude. So what is formal verification? At a very high level, formal verification can be seen as taking as input a program or a system or a protocol, something that computes, something that evolves from one thing to another and does something. That's called the, the program P. And a property, or some properties or specifications, uh, which are properties of this program P. And it's called it S. And what you'd like to know as output is whether the program P indeed satisfies the specification S. Uh, meaning that no matter how the program is executed, under, no, under whatever input and under whatever environment and under whatever no determinism that you might have in that program, the program will satisfy S, no matter what. Or, if you cannot prove that, then you'd like to have a so-called counterexample. You'd like to have some run or input, some environment in which P violates S. And that's very useful because then you can use that to improve the program or the specification. The typical um, advantages that, um, that um, um, we as a community know that uh, formal verification um, <coughs> has, has are the following. So the, 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 obviously what you really want when you do formal verification is to be able to claim that your program is correct. But that depends a lot on many factors, on what properties, what you mean by correctness. Um, and um, in general what you really can claim is that your program doesn't have certain vulnerabilities post deployment. And those vulnerabilities are whatever you specify in your specification. Right? If you forgot to, say, to specify a certain vulnerability, then uh, the program may still have that problem. Right? In the extreme case, you can prove that your program satisfies the specification true for the empty specification, and yes, it satisfies it, but that doesn't mean much. Also, formal verification helps you find very subtle bugs. Um, bugs that you haven't thought about when you wrote your program initially. Because formal verification will enforce to go through all the, all the execution, all the behaviors of the program, and because of that, you will know when, um, um, it will tell you when a certain corner case, or um, uh, a certain case that you forgot about, uh, still lurks into your code. Also, it tells you, it helps you focus testing and auditing efforts. Right? Because if you have so many functions in your code and you verify, manage to formally verify 19, but you couldn't verify one of them, you know that you should look at that. You should investigate that uh, more deeply. And also, if you use it routinely, if you use formal verification routinely, if you have tools, and there are tools that you can use uh, on a regular basis, then 
they can help you in your everyday development of your, of your code. You start thinking actually differently about your code. You think of the code through the abstract lenses of the properties that the code should uh, satisfy. And because of that, um, you write better code in the end. So that's, uh, that's probably one of the least known benefits of remote verification. What I'd like to do next is to go through the entire spectrum of formal verification or formal analysis, or not even formal, analysis tools and, and technologies and techniques <coughs> that you can methods for your for your uh, for, for program. And I would like to use a metaphor, this dial metaphor, uh, to present them. And I warn you up front that it's going to be very rough uh, approximation of the reality. There is a, a, an entire universe of research and work. I cannot, you cannot minimize all that with just a couple of slides. But I think it will give you an idea that um, you can go as deep as you want with uh, formal analysis and formal verification, but at the same time you can stay very light and you have to find your right balance, where you think you should, you should stay. So at the minimum, so if you turn the dial to the left, you get very cheap methods, but at the same time, very little assurance. As you go to the right, you get more expensive methods, but, but also you get more and more assurance. So the minimum you can do and you should do is testing. And you should have lots of tests for your for your uh, program. Ideally, giving you for smart contract even complete coverage in reality, in real life, in real software, full coverage is, is, is very rarely achievable. But in smart contract, that's not too hard because they are smaller. Um, but keep in mind what Dijkstra said: that no matter how heavy you test, you are still not going to get any formal guarantees, any assurance correctness. You have more and more confidence that your code is correct, but you don't know if it is correct indeed. So that's why we say the testing is the minimum. Once you have lots of tests, then you can move further and do what I call here runtime monitoring that comes under lots of names. Some people call it runtime verification, others call it uh, uh, runtime assurance. Um, there's lots of different names. So what runtime monitoring really, what I mean by runtime monitoring on this slide is that you can run the program but now observe its execution. Don't look just at the input output relationship, if it passed the test or not. Look at the sequence of the behavior of the program. And uh, you can monitor, actually, the program as it runs. And if you see any violations, uh, then, um, then uh, you can report errors. An example could be division by zero. Right? So on EVM, division by zero is fine, but you may not want it. So then you can monitor for division by zero. Or other properties could be that you want to revert before the end of a function if you have an overflow during the function. So you have to look at the sequence of steps and you can monitor that. And I'm putting it right after testing because it's, um, it's uh, pretty um, 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 easy to achieve once, uh, once you have a running system. Of course, you have to instrument your program somehow to observe what's going on, but uh, that's, um, that's much lighter than uh, the, the other methods later on. However, like testing, runtime monitoring does not ensure correctness, unless you combine it with more complicated techniques like backups and proof of the correct backups, but we don't go into that here. <coughs> Further, you can do static analysis. Static analysis, um, there is a large variety of static analysis techniques out there, and I strongly encourage you to use any static analysis that you can put your hands on, uh, because um, they give you immediate feedback about your code that you can use right to improve the quality of your, of your code. So static anal analyzers typically, they scan your code and they look for known patterns. Uh, bad code, code that you should, or bad coding practices, code that you should not write. <coughs> um, and um, the advantage of static analysis tools is that they are typically very fast, you get immediate feedback, they show you where, they color your code, tell you exactly where problems might be in your code. Uh, the problem with static analysis could be that they miss certain errors that they are not uh, uh, trained uh, for, or uh, they don't implement. Or they may give you false alarms because they have to make trade-offs. Um, you can never prove a program correct statically, uh, complete automatically, so you have to make some trade-offs. And one of the trade-offs that analysis tools uh, make is to give you um, um, potential um, errors in your code. And then when you investigate them deeper, you realize that it's actually not a problem because I know why, because there are some additional users from some activities. So static analysis tool typically analyze the code, scan the code, but they don't go deep into the semantics of the, of the programming language uh, necessarily. 
If you want to go deeper, actually, to the same idea of language, you do what we call symbolic execution. Um, and uh, what symbolic execution is, you still running the program, but you run the program with inputs which are not known. If your function has two inputs A and B, you run the program with inputs A and B without knowing exactly what the inputs are, you look at the symbolic values A and B, and as you execute the program, you keep track of all the logical constraints and, uh, and, and what's going on in the, in the, in the running program. Um, and uh, the advantage of symbolic execution is that you cover a larger uh, state space or space of behavior of the program. Um, essentially, in theory, all possible behaviors. The problem now starts being that it doesn't scale, at some moment it will be very slow, or at some moment you have to make compromises because you don't know whether certain condition works or not. Um, so if you want to make it automatic, then you have to, again, accept some trade-offs. And uh, one of the trade-offs that is accepted in combination with symbolic execution is uh, what you call bounded model checking, where you explore all the program behaviors up to a certain bound, let's say up to uh, two iterations of each group, or one up to two recursive calls for each uh, function at most. And once you put such limits, then you can explore exhaustively the uh, state space, but the problem is that you enforce yourself a finite, uh, smaller uh, state space, which means that you may, you may lose uh, errors. If you want to be absolutely sure that you don't lose any behavior, then you have to go into, uh, into formal verification. And here I'm calling it state-of-the-art verification because this is what most of the people who do formal verification understand by verification and probably most of the people also in this room which is um, um, the fact that you have a programming language and that programming language provides some specification language, another language on top of your existing language that allows you to specify properties of interest and then your tool, your formal verification tool <coughs> analyzes all the behaviors of the program against those the, the, the specified properties and with some help eventually you may be able to, to prove maybe some additional hints, additional lemmas, you may be able to prove the properties correct. Uh, so this is the conventional program verification and I say conventional because um, you, what you are going to see next goes beyond, beyond, beyond that. Um, so the limitation actually of, of the traditional verification approach of, of programs is that uh, um, you tend to be stuck with one particular language or version of your programming language and one and more more importantly one particular version of your specification language right you think that some language constructs are really important to specify or some specification constructs like always eventually are really, really important so you add them to your language for properties but then later on if you need something else you're out of luck because you cannot the tool doesn't support that um, if you want to have to start going into, into, into deeper uh, reasoning and deeper analysis of your, of, your, of your system, then you go to formal modeling and validation of your model. Meaning that you take your program and you model it in some other system, a theorem prover or, 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 or interactive uh, verification environment, where you can now reason completely mathematically about the program, forgetting any programming language. You don't care about the programming language anymore. Right, you define a transition system in your uh, more abstract environment, and then you can reason about it there, you can prove important properties there without taking the code of the into consideration. <coughs> and that's really useful because it helps you find high-level errors potentially in your in your in your code that uh, may have been hidden in the actual code. Uh, so when you are more abstract, you can see more abstract problems. For example, you can see design issues of your business logic of your entire contract at that, at that point. <coughs> So many, many people, many customers to work with, we take them through the various steps and at some point we get to this point and they say, oh, actually, we really want that. So once you understand the value of, of, uh, of modeling, then you really like to go, to go that path. But now you have a gap between that model and the actual code that needs to be filled. And this is what takes us to the, to the final stage, which is um, verification or proving your code correct using frameworks. All right, so you take a programming language, a program in a programming language, you have a formal mathematical model of what you meant to implement in your code, and now you have to prove that these two are, that the program indeed implements the, the, the formal model. And to do that, you need another language, a language you can, you can express both of these and do all the proofs. 
And uh, you may have heard of systems like Coke or Isabel, and the system that we use K falls into the same category. Right, so as we go from left to right, cheaper, less assurance, expensive, but uh, more assurance. <coughs> and ideally, we'd like to do all this automatically, but unfortunately, it's not possible. There's only that much that we can automate. And traditionally, we can automate almost all, everything up to symbolic execution, and even some part of symbolic execution. But when you try to go beyond that, a human expert tends to be needed, unless you restrict yourself to very simple properties. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's the general um, uh, picture of, of, of program analysis. You cannot have anything uh, free or automated. But nevertheless, you should use everything that is automatable in your, in your contracts. If you're anything in high assurance, and you should be, then you should use all these all these tools. So what we intend to do today is to show you how we approach this spectrum of form analysis tools uh, from our angle. And our angle is the K framework. Um, the K framework is great in what regards expressiveness. So with putting the right hands, you can do almost everything you want with it. But um, on the other hand, many people find it heavy to use because of the heavy notation and, uh, and uh, lack of automation. So our challenge here is how can we automate as much as possible in what you can do with a uh, language uh, like framework like, like K. And here we look at two types of automation. Automation that we know about, things that we have done with K, and we know that those can be done better and faster. Um, and that's what we try to do with the Firefly tool that uh, Everest here we talk about. So basically, Firefly tries to automate everything we know we can automate in K for smart contracts. In a complication of smart contracts. And then there is a lot of automation going on in the program verification community developed by decades of research by amazing researchers like Shuvan here. And, and Microsoft Research actually is a leader in, in that field. And, and what we'd like to do is to take advantage of all this automation and incorporate it into the K framework. And we want to do that by connecting the K framework with very sort of program verification tool for solidity um, contracts developed by uh, Microsoft. No, I'll go into more detail how to, how to do that. <clears throat> Before we dive into our own approach, I would like to tell you that there is a suite of tools <coughs> with a high degree of automation for formal analysis of smart contracts that you should definitely look at and try, which are not developed by us. Uh, and many of them have talks, actually, uh, 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 um, in this depth one. Like me, text and me, and I think Bernard here will talk at 10, okay, half an hour. Um, Slitter by Trace of Meets, Security and Verex by Chain Security. All these are amazing, amazing tools, and you should definitely try, try to use them, especially when, when, when they were uh, out of the box. And now I'm going to go deeper into, into our approach. Based on the K framework. So, why do we like K framework? It's mainly because it, it, it supports all languages, it's designed to work with all programming languages. And in particular, that means with all versions of a given particular language. Uh, it takes solidity because all versions are the same, the same way. You don't have to touch anything in the K framework to switch from one version of a language to another or from one language to another completely. And this is the philosophy or the vision underlying the K framework uh, that you should define a programming language once and for all. You have a formal language definition that includes syntax, semantics, everything. And everything else, all the tools, that you need for that language should be derived automatically or semi-automatically from that one definition of your language. That includes not only parsers and interpreters, but also symbolic execution engines, module checkers, deductive program verifiers, and everything. And all of these black boxes, blue boxes, are separate tools, but they are all completely language um, um, agnostic. Or put it differently, when you implement a tool, a formal analysis tool, or an analysis tool for a language, you typically pick two things. You pick the language, you pick the tool, like then you develop a system, your tool, um, uh, which is hardwired now to that language and to that uh, particular type of analysis. So you have languages, and then you have tools, and many tools pick one language and one tool, like Java, or the Java, for example. Right, so what the K framework proposes is actually to not do that. It proposes to encapsulate all the tools and to make them all parametric in a programming language. And the programming language then can be formalized and passed as input. The tool takes the programming language as input. Uh, as and when we say programming language, you don't mean a translation of the programming language in some other intermediate language. 
So just exactly the parameter which it is. Uh, so that approach, we started working on the case framework like more than 20 years ago. Um, and only two years ago we switched to a blockchain and it was really easy to do because all we had to do was to plug and play blockchain uh, language. Everything else stayed exactly, exactly the same. And for um, Ethereum blockchain, we immediately looked at uh, the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, we didn't want to verify programs to the solidity level at the beginning. We just wanted to start directly with the bytecode to eliminate potential errors in, compiler, in the compilers uh, from the from the, the trust base. And um, and uh, we have given actually Everett and other students, I know if they should for that, so they were students taking uh, classes and, uh, and they said, oh, actually we think you want for more semantics to EVM and then you use the key framework with EVM. And uh, that class project then turned into a research project and then it turned into an actual product uh, now. Uh, so there is a complete formal semantics of EVM in A, it's open source, everything you do is, is open source. Um, and um, and um, it is complete uh, in the sense that we can run any EVM program with it, it's like a, like a client. And actually we generate from the semantics, number one of the blue boxes was the interpreter. With that interpreter capability, we generate an actual client, uh, EVM client. Um, um, and uh, and uh, it is pretty efficient, or efficient enough that you can use it for, uh, for uh, actual real, uh, real uh, work. In particular, it is uh, a bit faster than Qlum JS, which is the JavaScript uh, uh, emulator of, of EVM in, in Truffle. And it is only a few times slower than the C++ implementation of Ethereum. So that really makes it usable as an implementation. But remember, it's just a mathematical model. The exact same mathematical model to use for verification, without any gap uh, between the implementation and the verification. Also, several people in the community use it, use the EVM, the KVM semantics as, as the canonical specification of the EVM. Um, and we have a website, jellopaper.org, where, uh, which website was completely automatically generated from the EVM semantics. And we generate it, we update it each time we modify the semantics. And that's human readable. Uh, you can go and read it. It's, uh, it's the canonical specification of the EVM. All right, and the Firefly tool that Everett will talk about is and as I mentioned, it, it tries to automate what we're already doing, okay, but in a way that other people can also use for this uh, automation, not only uh, experts uh, in K or foreign methods. So it is an instance of the K framework with the EVM semantics and with lots of automation in various boxes and all under the hood so that for new users of Firefly, it's just a push button thing. You just push button and don't even need to see what is complexity. So that's, so Firefly attempts to automate uh, um, uh, whatever is there in the case framework already, while the combination with very solved, the, the, the invention here is to, to build uh, upon the legacy of successful tools developed by Microsoft Research, and many of you may have ordered Z3, Booty, Coral, so all these amazing technologies are already incorporated in Verisol. Um, the problem is that there is a gap between what Verisol does analysis at the solidity level, and what we do with KVM, which analysis at the bytecode level, using an actual form of semantics. So what we'd like to do now is to connect the two, and to regard very well as a, as a, as a user-friendly, lightweight front-end that, uh, that uh, generates all the verification artifacts that you need uh, down there, then to reconstruct the proof at the bytecode level. And this way you achieve everything you want, you achieve automation, a very small trust base, because now we only have to trust the formal semantics of the EVM, and at the same time, uh, the And with that, I'm going to, to, uh, to let uh, the actual uh, implement the tools <laughs> talk. Um, and we'll start with uh, Shubendu, give us a mobile view of any sort.
So uh, thanks for coming. So thank you for uh, inviting me as part of this session. I was uh, quite honored. So uh, I work at Microsoft and I see some familiar faces. Um, uh, thanks to all the uh, shout outs to the research from Microsoft Research. I don't claim uh, credit for any of them, but I've been on the engine room while these technologies like Z3, Boogie, and Coral. Can you hear me? Or <coughs> have been developed. So I've been fortunate enough to sort of be part of some of these technologies or be in the engine room while these have been developed. So, um, so the goal was uh, so we had. Uh, a team in Microsoft called Azure Blockchain, and they started uh, taking dependence on smart contracts. So it was naturally quite interesting to us to see if we could help them. So that's how the journey got started. And uh, uh, then we'll be talking with uh, Grigori about how to combine these two techniques and what's the landscape of tools and so on. So, so what is Verisol? So the way I think of it is a formal specification and verification tool for Solidity smart contracts. And it's a research project in my mind. So um, um, this is the GitHub page. There are lots of collaborators from Microsoft, from Austin, and a growing set of collaborators from other places in Argentina and so on. So what was the motivation for Verisol? So to me, the motivation was that we need to empower the developers who are writing smart contracts for a living. Because there are, as Gregory said, it's a, it's a it's a very crucial, uh, important uh, set of uh, applications that you build with lots of security holes, and you would like to reason about them, not just for audit, but also while you're developing, so you have some idea. Uh, and this initially started with the focus on the actual blockchain uh, smart contracts that they were building for the infrastructure and all the samples. So we had some, uh, that was the starting point. And also, as Grigori said, one of the goals is to expose a lot of research that has sort of matured in the research community, bring it up to developers uh, with fairly well-defined expectations. So not all of them are the most automated tools in the market, but they have sort of an expectation that uh, exactly what is expected of them. So, um, so Z3, many of the, many of the tools uh, use Z3 for uh, symbolic reasoning. Boogie is a state-of-the-art intermediate verification language, so instead of as, as uh, like K, it's, uh, it's it's in a different flavor, like it's a verification language that you can map different languages. And then Coral is a push button interprocedural checker, so it's completely push button scalable, driven by the assertions that you want to prove, not by the number of paths in the program. And there's a lightweight but very predictable uh, in inference of annotations when you don't have uh, all the annotations. And also, a, a kind of push the envelope on the research as we look at more contracts. And as I said, this is, these are not the most optimized for the purpose, but they have a sort of well-defined expectations. Um, I've been fortunate to uh, use some of these tools in production, in Windows, uh, and uh, IE, and found lots of bugs. Um, people have used it in the, the static driver verifier, which is shipped with uh, the driver verifier. So these tools have a history of being tested in production, where people are taking dependencies on these tools. For, um, so I will go ahead and give a few examples as I go along. And uh, we recently released a, a .NET uh, global tool, so you can try to install at some point. There could be bugs. And I have a set of examples that I'm going to walk through today, just to get a flavor of uh, what the tool looks like. So we'll start with the DAO example. It's most famous and notorious. So, uh, so this is the DevOps. So this is the notorious DAO example, and uh, we all know about the reentrancy bug. But let's say you were just write, rewriting the DAO example and you knew nothing about reentrancy. So what is it that you were looking for? Let's say a language that doesn't have the inference. What is it that you should be thinking about? So here is one example that says that, uh, well, there's a withdraw method that is responsible for withdrawing funds from uh, the balances of the DAO. But I guess one of the ingredients that you want to preserve is that no matter what the code says, yes. what you want to uh, say is that if I call withdraw, then 
the sender should not withdraw more than they have entitled to. Their entitled to. That seems like a natural specification. It should be equal, ideally, but I'll show you examples where it actually can. Uh, equal, equality is too strong because uh, an attacker can actually go and donate something to you. So, but this says that roughly that uh, uh, anybody should not get more money than they want. So you write this specification. So it uses some uh, code contracts libraries that you support. So it uses mostly uh, syntax, ensures and all other new things in there. And uh, so I have the bug in there, line uh, 27. And It's a command line tool right now, and uh, it tries a couple of things. It tries to get a proof first, and if it doesn't find a proof, uh, then it tries to look for counter examples. So in this case, it sort of gives you a couple of examples that say you have to call the constructor with certain arguments, and then you donate, because without donating, you cannot withdraw, so you donate. And then you withdraw, call the withdraw method, right? And then the assertion that we wrote down fails. And, uh, uh, for um, unfortunately, only for Windows at this point, we have a viewer that can help you debug to the tape. trace. I'm not going to show it, but you can actually step through the trace and see values uh, as they. Uh, So you can see values printed along the face just to get you a better sense of what's going on. So that's the experience. And uh, so I'll go ahead and do the fix, which is uh, you update. So basically, many people know we basically update the credit of the sender before we uh, <coughs> before we do that. So in this case, it actually found a proof, meaning that uh, this DAO will be able to satisfy the property that we wrote down. And the interesting thing is, uh, the detail is how do you model the adversary. So we have a notion called callback where the adversary can call into any of your functions. So with that, with that model, we have a proof. So this is sort of the experience. Um, so I'll show you the GRC20, something that So this is sort of, uh, I guess many people are familiar with the ERC20 token. This is the one from Open Zeppelin with sort of modified a little bit. And uh, the thing that we're trying to reason about here Right, again, the question is, what do, you, what do you do with the token? Once you're designing the token, what do you look for? So one nice specification uh, is that uh, the total supply that's in the token should be the same with sum of all the balances in the, in the, of all the addresses. And that helps you sort of get a good mental model of what, what an internal invariant is. And if you show this to a customer, they might say, OK, this looks reasonable. I, if you can show this, maybe I'll trust your code better. And so the thing I'm going to show is, uh, so up here, I'm sorry. So this is the method called uh, transfer. And interestingly, uh, Open Zeppelin doesn't check for uh, when you send an amount, the, uh, the sender has to have that much amount. And the reason it does it because it relies on the underflow uh, semantics of the safe path. So the safe path sort of makes it safe. Because if you don't have enough money, the safe path will fail, and then you'll abort the execution. So how do you find that without knowing the internals of safe math? So the invariant that I wrote down, if you change the safe math to a regular subtraction, then uh,
So again, it refuses to find a proof. And it calls you, uh, it shows the counter example where you're trying to drain an amount one from somebody who did not have any 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 uh, credits in them. And, uh, and this is interesting because it requires you to reason about the underlying semantics of arithmetic. If you don't, if you're not careful and don't use modular arithmetic, you might see a proof where it does not exist. So that, this shows basically various levels of abstraction you can reason and the kind of guarantees you can get. The modular arithmetic is not a very scalable solution, so if you try to use it for thousand line programs, there's lots of deep invariants and not scalable. So you have to choose, but you sort of set up an expectation of where you want to invest. Okay. Um, I just want to show one more example, um, which is an example from uh, uh, this tool called Azure Blockchain <coughs> Systems that Microsoft was one of the products that Microsoft shipped uh, about a year back or maybe more. And it had a very nice way to uh, decompose a workflow policy. Many They realized many uh, smart contracts implement some kind of workflows. They're getting very, very popular in, uh, in the enterprise scenario. So they provided a nice language, uh, a JSON-based language, for uh, clear semantics of uh, what a workflow looks like. And then the question is, does the Solidity program implement the workflow? Can you make it full screen <coughs> so people can see? Yes, thank you. <coughs> right, so here is think of just the specification language with a bunch of state machines and actions and some access controls, and there's the Solidity smart contract. And the question is whether uh, the smart contract defines the state machine. Um, so in this case, it turns out there was a discrepancy. In, it turns out it was in the specification. But nevertheless, there was something that was uh, different in the two, two versions. <coughs> and so this requires sort of a very deep analysis because they could take uh, up to seven steps to get to the state. Right? So shallow execution will not be able to get to this part. So this is, uh, I'm going to show this example. Um, so in this case, it did not find the proof, but it takes a little while to actually find the counter example. But still, it's reasonable, it's a few seconds. But it just shows you the complexity of the search space. So uh, since this is assertion guided, it can scale a little better. But of course, it has its limits. So you can see you have to issue one, two, three, four, five, six, seven transactions to reach this. So people in testing have might have missed this. Okay. So so getting back. Um, which time do we have? So, okay. so it shows you the flavor of verification. So for this one, for example, if you just want to do a push button verification, you have access to this for all. If you want to do proofs, you can write ingredients and uh, interact with the tool. Uh, but the nice thing we have observed is that uh, the domain of smart contract is kind of nice in that the open environment of adversary makes it easier for the verification to move in many cases. Um, so that is actually a, a nice thing. So the infrastructure for uh, Verisol looks like this. So we have a solidity program with specifications. Uh, for specifications, if we include this uh, cold contract library, uh, that is available. And uh, I call it cold contract because it's sort of the, the solidity syntax. You get the resolution from solidity. You can get syntax errors in the specification directly from the compiler. And then we're working on uh, translating the subset of solidity to boogie that is very reasonably high level. So we're not going to try to do deep verification about how data is layout by the PyCode compiler. That's something that K does very well. And that's something very hard to automate, uh, hard to automate at the by source code level. And you're also sort of trying to do what the compiler is doing. So here the reasoning is much more abstract level, which I think is good for business projects that we see in enterprises. Um, and then the host of tools that we uh, uh, rely on, um, which are being extended by us, by the community, as uh, the team the need. And so the outcome has three uh, out <coughs> outcomes. It has the proof, or you can have a trace. Or in the middle, you have something like, well, I've not been able to verify it fully or find a trace. But I have this uh, 
guarantee that any transaction of depth k, any set of transactions, if you issue up to k transactions, then I'm going to give you some assurance. So this gives you a, a reasonable uh, uh, guarantee to maybe stop testing and focus more on verification at this point. Okay, so the way it works is uh, it takes a contract, or think of this one contract, with a constructor and a bunch of arguments, and then creates this uh, driver of the hardness that sort of in, a, in an infinite loop calls any of the methods uh, in, in a, with arbitrary arguments. So you can imagine if you can verify something on this program, you verify it for all executions. Um, right. So the capabilities at this point is the code contract library. And we're consciously taking the decision to start with a known language so developers can uh, understand them without uh, needing a whole bunch of uh, sophisticated semantics of languages. Um, our initial customer was the folks in Azure blockchain who were uh, uh, systems developers, but they sort of understood the specifications, at least to some level. And uh, so we have the scalable push button, button validation violations and highly automated proofs using boogie. And by highly automated, I don't mean completely automated. You can need, might have to support some extra facts on the side. Um, so that's sort of the research problem is how do you know the bar there. And so we um, uh, uh, did uh, talk about some of the study on how we check workflow policies, the example that I showed. And also check some critical infrastructure that were built using smart contracts in uh, some of the products they have, uh, services they have shipped. And this is sort of uh, the governance protocols that underlie uh, these uh, things like Ethereum and Azure or uh, Azure blockchain service. So basically, they have implemented some of the uh, governance in smart contracts in Solidity. And so it's very crucial because any bugs there might just. Uh, um, compromise the entire infrastructure. And so you have to ask questions uh, like, can I get into a deadlock? Like, can I remove the last administrator so that now no transactions can be issued? And usually the work happened as, like it happens in K, you consult with the designer, and you come with the specification, do boundary checking, and then help them with invariants, and you repeat them while the code is being developed. So we were very fortunate that we could actually do this while the program was being developed and tested and found bugs, several bugs. So that was a very nice experience, and I think that uh, would be nice to scale out with such kind of experience. So that's sort of the goal of uh, the very solid tool, is to take it from a research prototype where we have a few customers to it, help more people uh, try to get a sense of the technology, and uh, enable the community either directly or by like, collaboration with folks at RV, and uh, so I'll mostly gloss over the specifications that we've been uh, adding to the code contract library. It's evolving, so we need to check back in two months, maybe two months. But essentially, these are sort of well-known um, well facts that you uh, that are necessary for doing any program verification. These may not be sufficient. So pre-post pre -post conditions, contract invariance, group invariance. And in contract invariance can mean various things to various people, so you have to do it. There's a spectrum of what it can be. And uh, so it's it's a library, and then you have uh, stops for people's uh, conditions. So for example, you can call it Venisol or contract invariant, requires, ensures, invariant. And, and I know there's uh, work in the Solidity compiler on supporting some of these uh, specification primitives. So we are sort of waiting and watching to see once they come up, we can sort of leverage some of that. And uh, so it's not tied to this language in any way. This is just a way to expose the, the facilities to developers. And then again, once you support the search language, you need to reason about the old value and uh, mapping. Um, so the example is shown in ERC, but I very need to say that total choice, total supply is equal to the sum of all the balances. It's very hard to do uh, in, in, in code because you cannot even write such a specification uh, because Mappings don't allow it, uh, iterating over all the indices and so on. So, so there are some things that is uh, really get a lot of value just specifying it um, and even doing bounded checking. And then we're working on other extensions. Uh, uh, part of the talk that we have with uh, uh, 
REs, what kind of stuff. So they have a lot of experience in that contracts and the low level specifications. So what are the good uh, high level equivalent of them is the question. So next three to six months, we have a bunch of contracts <coughs> and uh, coverage of solidity. So the reason I say high level reasoning, I don't think we are going to go uh, uh, the parts of solidity that require uh, like low level reasoning that is no not to scale the at the at the higher at the at the SFT level. So if you want automation, then you have to sort of carve out sort of a high level language. And what I've seen in the enterprise, people don't really care about well, so I shouldn't generalize. Um, they are happy to live with a, a fragment that they can be more sure of rather than getting uh, optimized gas. <laughs> so, so there is a hope that, that a lot of the reasons can be reasoned at a high level. Um, we're going to work on a VS Code extension to make it easier. And then going forward, uh, this, the discussion we're having is what kind of specifications can be added beyond like, assertions, can be temporal logic, and uh, there are a lot of research in the community also on how to improve invariant inference, how to get users more control of, how to invariant inference. And uh, this is the grand challenge, how do we push these proofs all the way down to the whiteboard? I think that's a very, very interesting problem that we require research. So yeah. So with that I'll conclude and uh, yeah. if there are any questions in the please. Yeah. No, that's the future plan. It's to, once you get a proof at the very small level, we'd like to convince K that it, it actually uh, holds at the bytecode level, right? So that is the that is the long term goal. Yeah, I'm not there. I'll talk about how to do this one. Are you considering to have a Linux uh, version for the? There is both a Linux and a Mac version of the rules. Uh, yeah, you can download it. It's not the visualizer. The visualizer, no. Somebody has to build the visualizer. Uh, but the rest of the tools is there. Yeah, there's a new package you can just get to work. Yes. Um, hello. I'm going to work on formal verification of uh, consensus algorithms. For of what? Consensus algorithms. Consensus algorithms, yes. We are going to talk a bit about that at the end. Thanks. So. Yeah. All right. Um, let's get started. So, hi, my name is Adrian. I'm um, going to talk about <coughs> the application of the DM bytecode. Um, with more focus on the case study of the 2 point of deposit contract we recently verified. Uh, the title is contains verification, but I'm not talking about the verification too much because already uh, we talk about verification. I'm talk about more about the uh, bytecode. So those of you who don't know about bytecode will learn something about bytecode. If you know already about bytecode, will find this interesting. So before uh, going to that, uh, let me give a quick overview of our bytecode verification tool. So we have the EVM bytecode verification tool that built on top of the K framework and the KVM that we described. And this tool has two inputs, uh, program bytecode and the specification. Uh, and it checks that the program satisfies the, uh, the specification or not. Um, this is very similar to very so at the high level. The main difference is that it works at the bytecode level. Uh, why the map, why the bad code level uh, uh, is better? I will talk about it a little bit later. But let me give you a quick example how this tool works. So this is the program, very simple program that uh, similar like ERC twenty transfer types of program. Uh, we have the receiver address from sender, uh, sorry, from and to and value, and update balances uh, of the from and to. Uh, using the set map, so uh, it, uh, if, if any underflow or overflow is in the return true. 
So given this program, you first compile down into the bytecode, you put in the bytecode in, in, into our tool, and then next you have to write down a specification, uh, which, which specify what the behavior that this program should have. Uh, so here we are describing the, the behavior of the program uh, in the success case, which means that if the balance is enough, I mean, standard balance is enough, and there's no overflow happens, then the balances will be updated uh, as like a proper way. Uh, I'm not going to too details about how this specification uh, I mean, details are, but the thing is, you have to write down the specification at the bytecode level in this way. And some people say that, wow, specification is longer than program. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, and, and this is why what Gregor mentioned, it requires a whole network to write down the specification and also working at this level. Uh, our future goal is to let you just write down the specification as annotation language, like ensures and requires for P and post condition, saying that, okay, this transfer function, if the two preconditions satisfied, like balance is enough and no overflow happens, then the post condition means that whenever this transfer returns uh, uh, safely, I mean, returns true, whatever, or not, but the balances should be updated as expected. So if you write down this specification at the high level, I mean, the source code level, our goal is automatically generate this, case, I mean, bytecode level specification. So you don't need to work on this level. Um, but that's the future work. Uh, we are still working on that, but we're hoping that uh, uh, providing this feature. So, using our this tool, we verified some high-profile um, smart contract. So, very recently, we verified if 2.0 departs contract. That I guess you will learn more about this in the later this E2.0 uh, talk. Uh, but the main thing is that this contract is really important contract when you want to be a validator of E2.0. Because you want, you need to deposit your some ether to be a validator. Sending your deposit into this contract at the if 1.x, and then this contract is one a function, so you can deposit something, but you cannot, we cannot withdraw. But the deposit whatever made here will be claimed in the if 2.0 uh, network. So it's really important first make sure that you cannot withdraw. <laughs> The second, whatever you deposit here will be available in the Interpono network. There's really important uh, uh, contract that needs to be correct, so we recently verified this. <laughs> and this is our case study. I will, I will show you what we found while verifying this contract. And we have other contracts like uh, Gnosis Safe. Um, I think, <coughs> what is it? Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a multi signature wallet. <coughs> and uh, we also, um, I mean, the MakerDAO, we say recall, is also verified using our uh, uh, verification tool, but not by us, by that um, guy. So we are very happy that our tool is used by another uh, to verify their own system. So we are hoping to more people using our verifier to verify their system, uh, and then that's why we are working really hard to push ourselves to more, much more easier to use our tool, and that's the more or less the Firefly talk in the final talk. And then we have some other bunch of the uh, 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 smart contract. And now I'm going to explain why we are really obsessed in this bytecode verification. The first reason is the bytecode is what really runs on the blockchain, not the source code, right? And then Compilers, believe it or not, have bugs. I'm not talking about the solid compiler, just uh, uh, itself. I mean, usually compiler, even the C compiler, like GCC or LLVM, which is really mature and developed long uh, uh, period of time, has bugs. New bugs reported even now, today. And some bugs actually hidden in for 20 years. Simply, some guys are lucky to hit trigger the bugs hidden for 20 years and they report it. So, compiler is bug, actually more than you expected. So, the thing is, even if you verify your source code is correct, 
if compiler has some, has some problems, then that doesn't mean that. For example, very so, using very so verify thing, it just assumes that compiler is correct. If it's not the case, then your verification is does not actually guarantee what you really want. So this is really important. That, that's why we are actually working at the bytecode level. And indeed, we found some issues in the E2 device contract while we verify the bytecode level. That's I'm going to talk about. So before explaining what box we found, let me give a very quick uh, background on the how to read the bytecode. I mean, how to read I mean, bytecode <coughs> arrays. So, okay. Suppose you have a byte arrays, like length 2 or 32, 33. How that represented at the EVM level? The single byte is not represented as a single byte. It represents as two words, essentially 64 bytes. So essentially, uh, is in each line, uh, 32 byte line. The very first 32 bytes denotes what the size of this byte, which is 1, so it's 0, 0, 0, 001. And then you have an uh, actual byte, the data, one byte, and then followed by zero bytes, so 31 zeros. If you have uh, a byte of two, then again, okay, size two there, and then two bytes here, and then zero bytes, and so on and so forth. Um, if you have a 32 bytes, you know it's already online, so, so you, you don't have any zero bytes there. But that's the how byte arrays are represented in the ABVM level. And if you have a tuple of byte arrays, like arguments, uh, or if you return something, then they store as a tuple of the bytes. And then if you have, a, for example, two, a tuple of two byte array, then you simply put this, like these guys, put these two, and then you put on top of this simply offset. But this offset uh, points where the, uh, each element stops. So, since the offset is simply fixed, so what, if you want to find some first or element or the next element, you find that you go to the offset, find that by where to start, and you read the size, and then read from here to the size. That's how you uh, decode or encode this byte array. That's you all need to know to, to understand now the box. Okay, so first, what we found the device contract. So this is a uh, one of the function, the deposit contract called get deposit count function, which simply <laughs> is return some lower. Oh, by the way, this is a viper. Uh, so, uh, those of you not familiar with this viper, is similar to Solidity, but simply Python ish syntax. So you can, I guess, read. Uh, so it return this deposit count, this storage value, but in the real Indian form. So it's simply a uh, uh, reverse device. So Okay, well, okay, so assume that this two little Indians is simply correct. Then, those of you who think that, I mean, any problem with this simple two lines of code, how could it be wrong, right? I mean, assume that this is correct, right? Assume that this two little Indians is correct. Can you think about something's wrong with this code? Yes? So when you swap it around and then you cut off to get the bytes eight, you might cut off the wrong data. Ah, uh, that's that's very good um, guess, um, but that's somehow handled by very well. This two little India. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, very good guess. That's right. It's yeah. I'm sorry. Actually, I tortured you because I it, it, you, you cannot get this because because <laughs> problem happens in the compiler. By the compiler. So this is the return, the uh, uh, value when you call this function. If this contract compiled by Viper version 1.0 beta 11, which is the latest version at the time, we start this verification. Do you see any problem with this? Um, if you follow me the previous preliminary, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's uh, the, the, the 20 appears. Right. This, this is all zero, but here we see something is non-zero there. What happened? What? 
So what will happen is that, so compiler, and, oh, oh, first of all, don't worry about it, it's already fixed. Uh, so compiler, <laughs> what compiler does is that they, when they do this, they need to uh, prepare this data in the local memory and then they return. They first write down offset, this is correct, and write down the size, and then they copy this departed count, departed count and then they need to be put all the zero, like, uh, this is 8 bytes, so 24 bytes of zero there. But somehow, compared to Bob, they only put the zero only 8 bytes. They leave whatever the 16 bytes there, and the problem is these 16 bytes of the local memory garbage came from this function um, uh, uh, side effect. So there is just garbage there, which is non zero. So, um, so this is the, the example of the compiler bug, and then you cannot find this unless you work on the particle level. And and then, I mean, Ethereum, I mean, Ethereum Foundation write down this code, there's good job and no problem, but if you just deploy this without this verification, right, and then you have these non-incorrect zero bytes, and then somehow, the, another contract that assume that expect that it's all zero may be exploited by some other so This is really thing. That's why we really think that the bipolar verification is important. Um, I have a, another talk which is more interesting. But I have no. But I have no. Uh, okay. Let me quick, very quick. So this is a main function departure. The departure function takes now three arguments, all the bytes array. And then they check that the length is whatever expected. Now this is the uh, tuple of three elements, like offsets and, and the uh, three arguments. Now, what if this whole data input is not valid? For example, like by mistake or maliciously uh, uh, crap. For example, like there's no actual bytes, only this six word. So this is a correct one, 12 words. What if you provide only six words? You might think that, oh, there's no bytes, right? No actual data, so data length is zero. So, but now we have a length check. So it may divert, right? Right? But what will happen is, this is a count example, simply six bytes. Offset, 96, 128, 160, and the three sides, like 48, 32, 96, came from this uh, size. And then no bytes. This is all. And then, given this, the departure function simply goes through. Doesn't even work. Let, let me explain why. First, we try to read up key, so the first argument. First, go to the offset. It goes to the this is a uh, start of data. So you read the size. for oh, size is size is 48. So you you read 48 bytes. Simply starting from here, to here. So they simply decode. Consider this garbage as a top key. Move on. Next, you go to the second offset. It goes to this, and its size is 36, 32. And then simply read this guys, which is actually another size, the so another card is read it. Even more, now third, third one, you go to third offset, it points to this, you read the side, which is 96, and try to read beyond of the call data, this 96, and what really happened is the yellow paper of the uh, Ethereum virtual machine says that if you want to read something beyond all data, you read that as if infinite zero are there already. It means that it's simply when you read this, simple out of bound of sets, simply return all zero. This is what happened. Given this in the call data, the decoding process simply read three arguments, all the garbage, <coughs> which, for example, signals is all zero. You cannot claim later e, e 2.0 chain whenever you are deposited. So if, if you make any mistake or somehow malicious user somehow uh, flip the bits in your call data, 
then you have this. But this shouldn't happen. But previously, simply that go through and deposit this wrong information, and then you simply lost your deposit. So again, the story is <coughs> it's really important to work at the vital level if you want your full assurance of, of your smart country when deployed. And then, so far, we are using our cable tool, which requires some export and then some really high effort. So, so far, actually, the large group like Ethereum Foundation or some <coughs> who can afford this large effort can use our tool to verify that. But we are really hoping that even small startup can use our tool to full guarantee of their smart contract. And that's why we are working on this uh, next of the pipeline. Any, any questions while you see the slides for the show? So concerning the first issue, yep. so the, the non-zero bytes, can they affect the correctness of that, that, um, then, uh, of that call specifically? Because it sounds like, uh, did, did they affect the correctness of that call Yeah, first of all, there's not ABI uh, standard return value. The ABI standard specifically says that if you have a uh, non-aligned uh, return value, you need to have a full zero bias. And then that ABI is simply like protocol, right? So whoever who call this that contract would assume that there is a there are gonna be a zero bias. If somehow they exploit that fact, like like just just copy those into another local memory, assuming that always a zero, may have different behavior. But this is a promise, right? I mean, you need to return something, you need to follow some rules. So, yeah, that's the problem. Thanks, Dejun. Dejun had some more interesting slides after that, which I'm bummed we didn't get to, but you should ask him about it afterwards on, on some equivalence <coughs> checking and stuff that we can do okay. Um, okay, so I'm here to talk about Firefly. And this is our attempt to take uh, ABM, which is kind of hard to use, uh, and wrap it up into an easy to use tool that kind of just works in the background and does everything in an automated fashion. Um, as opposed to now, where you basically need or to even use the K tool at all. Um, so this is an overview of my talk. First, I'm just going to talk briefly about the motivation of why we want something like this. Uh, show you our roadmap. It's stretched out over about two years. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the individual tools that are on our roadmap, which we have prototypes for all of the tools except this last one, but the roadmap is still spread out over some time so we can do testing and internal stuff like that. Um, as a motivation, we have tools like Verisol that are easy to use, they're high level, they're at the Solidity source code level, um, and developers can just basically use them out of the box. Uh, um, but the problem is, as Dejane pointed out, you don't get the guarantees that you would want at the EVM bytecode level. Um, but then we have KVM, which is a low-level EVM bytecode verification tool, which really takes an expert to use. Um, and somehow there's not something bridging the gap between these two. So that's what we're trying to trying to do. Um, so ideal, the ideal scenario for Firefly is that it's going to be a drop-in testing client replacement for whatever you use as your testing framework. Right now we're kind of targeting Truffle. Uh, so basically just replace Ganache with Firefly, and then you're off to the races. Um, and just a couple more bullet points, but yeah, uh, one goal, no user intervention required. It should be that you just run the tool instead of your normal testing tool, and it does the extra analysis and reports the results back to you. Uh, another goal, easy for us to roll out more features and reporting over time. Uh, and then another goal is easy to dispatch large jobs in parallel to a server somewhere. Uh, so these are kind of some long-term goals of the project. Uh, not specifically tied to any of the actual tools we're developing, but we'll, uh, we'll develop the tools with this in mind. Here's the long-term roadmap. Um, you can see it goes out to December 2020. Uh, I'll talk about these ones, which are part of the Firefly suite a little bit more, but then they're on the right-hand side, uh, beyond Firefly, where we get back into where you need a formal methods expert present again. Um, and we are doing some kind of prototyping of these tools out here. Um, so specification generation, instead of having to write down a specification and verify your contract, we will generate it for you. Uh, and proof object generation is basically the highest level of assurance that you can get with, uh, with anything formal methods. Um, usually, usually not done except in like the most uh, safety critical sorts of systems, but we're 
you know, we're toying with the idea of moving in that direction. Um, uh, this is our more specific Firefly roadmap. Uh, we have KS set up so that we have like a front end, which basically takes the case specification and translates it into multiple back ends. The LLVM back end is our fast interpreter, so whenever we talk about the performance of K compared to other things, we're talking about the LLVM generated interpreter um, for the for the case specification. And then whenever we talk about symbolic execution or proving, we're talking about the Haskell backend, which is the one that actually does the proof steps needed to do symbolic execution. Um, I'm going to talk about each of these tools in a little more detail, but we're starting off with just a test runner. You just basically replace you know, Ethereum JS VM with KVM, uh, and then everything looks the same as normal from the perspective of you know, running trouble tests. Uh, test case coverage reporting is next. That's what we're working on right now, is kind of integrating that coverage report data back into Truffle. Runtime monitoring, um, which is like bounded model checking V1. Um, and then assertion violation checker, which is where we're going to actually integrate with the Verisol tool to get kind of an assist from them. Uh, bounded model checker V2, which is where we're going to do it symbolically and exhaustively, and as opposed to here, which is going to be concrete and only on the test cases that your, your actual tests exercise. And then finally at the end is test case generation. Um, that's the one tool we don't have a prototype for yet, uh, but we will we'll get there. I'll explain why that's important or why it's nice. And maybe it's not important, I don't know. It's probably important, I guess. Um, okay, so the test runner. Uh, basically what we're doing is we're taking KVM and we're making it into a full client, having full client functionality so that you can just use it anywhere where you would use a full client for doing testing. Um, so we're just going to support the Web3 JSON RPC, uh, and we already have it to where you can basically just run Truffle test, but where you're running the KVM server in the background instead of running a, or the Firefly server in the background instead of running a Ganache, and it just works. Um, benefit of that is you get kind of more confidence in the test results because KVM is kind of regarded as a canonical spec of the EVM. Um, that's one of the canonical specs. So, uh, yeah, I mean, some people like that. You take it or leave it. And then performance is comparable to Ethereum JSVM, but we actually have several performance enhancements coming out that uh, are going to make us faster than Ethereum JSVM. And then we have just kind of special purpose Firefly under our Web3 JSON RPC commands for getting back reporting uh, data from KVM about you know, coverage or uh, analysis like the runtime monitoring, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, so then. Uh, so this is, this is just like the bare functionality you need. This exists right now. Um, but, the, but then everything is going to build on the fact that, okay, now this is just a drop-in replacement. You can switch over to using it, not really notice any change, and then we start rolling out features. Um, so the first feature we roll out is just to test coverage. Um, we're specifically going to measure off-code coverage. Um, so here's an example a report that the prototype spit out. Um, and you can see there's kind of this, this place after this jump by that's not tested by any of them. Everything else is tested by 73 different tests, but these are tested by zero tests. That's a hole in the coverage uh, data. Um, and so as a developer, if you were to see this report, what you'd want to do is you'd want to say, okay, where is this code coming from? So use a source map back to Solidity and uh, write a test in your, whatever testing harness you're using, like Solidity tests or, or uh, fire, uh, not fire tests. Like, you know, trouble tests. Um, I swear I know the word trouble. Um, yeah, so write a, write a test that targets these lines, and then uh, you would add that to your test set, and then the coverage report would come back green saying, okay, every, every opcode at least is covered. Which, like, you know, there's a lot of literature about whether, you know, opcode coverage or branch coverage or path coverage or something is the correct thing to do, but at least this is something, right? Um, by the way, there are tools that will do coverage already. So if you look at Brownie, that's a that's an existing tool that will uh, do coverage already. So common pitfalls in tests are, you know, you might not test something like the default or fallback function, right? You might only write tests for the positive cases of your contract where things are going smoothly. Um, so you don't write tests for the revert cases. You might not write tests that actually exercise the underflow, overflow, um, and then. Uh, you might not even test the ABI decoding because at the solidity level, the ABI decoding is not apparent or obvious at all because the compiler takes care of that for you. But as Dejun pointed out, if you assume that the compiler is doing it correctly, you could uh, you know, lose all the ETH1 funds when you try and move over to ETH2, uh, which kind of suck. Okay, so then the next uh, tool on the roadmap is a runtime monitor. Um, 
So basically what the runtime monitor is, is we instrument the semantics with uh, specific events, which basically can fire on any particular data from any particular point of execution during, uh, during running. Uh, the events that I have here as examples are overflow and revert in this example. So overflow, we just detect, you know, are we doing an addition and the addition overflows, or are we doing a subtraction and the subtraction underflows. Um, and revert is just that the revert opcode uh, fires, and then I made like a little state machine-ish thing here saying, you know, if we're doing execution and neither of these events are firing, we're just in this normal mode. If execution ends, we, we go to this no violation found mode. But if an overflow event fires, then we know that we have to revert, and if we end without reverting, then it's a violation. Uh, but if we end uh, with revert right here, then there's no violation because the overflow was followed by a revert. Um, so these properties are, are temporal in nature, so it's not enough to just say there are no overflows because it's pretty common that you will have an overflow during execution, but you have to instead say temporally every overflow is eventually followed by a revert before the end of the contract. Um, so we're just going to build these events directly into the semantics, um, and you know, users can supply more if they like, but then the semantics has to be recompiled. But the, uh, the properties themselves to check, like this formula right here, can be specified on the command line at runtime. So we can, we'll provide a preset bag of properties, users can write their own properties. Um, and then basically we're just gonna run the, the user's normal test sets. You still just run trouble test, um, but it runs it with this instrumented mode where it will check, you know, are these properties violated on these test runs? And then if it finds a violation of one of these properties on this test run, uh, the user can inspect that violation and write an actual truffle test that would have caught that violation anyway uh, so that you don't have to rerun this tool to get the same guarantee. So you can kind of add tests that uh, target these properties to your own test set. Um, so that's about the model checking V1. Assertion violation checker from our roadmap is, the, uh, is where we would get into looking at the pre and post conditions that Dejun was talking about or that Verisol will look at. Um, and so Verisol checks this property, the solidity level, but it, and there's lots of tools that do this, right? There's like the, the solidity SMT checker, there's uh, Verex, they have like an incomplete list somewhere. Sephora, Sephora, There's lots of tools that will do this, but we, you know, we're going to do it at the even bytecode level instead of the solidity level for the higher guarantees you get there. Um, and basically, because of the way EVM is structured, the way that Solidity compiles EVM, all we have to ask is, is it possible to ever reach the invalid opcode? Because the assertions, the post conditions at the end of the functions are translated to the invalid opcode of EVM. Um, and if you don't find that it's possible, then likely the user stated pre-post conditions hold. Uh, if you do, then we can provide a counterexample. And once again, that counterexample can turn into an actual trouble test so that it's quicker to catch next time uh, without having to rerun this tool. Um, so then we are planning on getting an assist from Verisol, so Verisol will first check it at the solidity level, uh, and, it, and it's much quicker to run Verisol, so, solidity, so it'll check at the solidity level, if it finds a violation, then you can just work with that directly, but then if Verisol gives you the green check mark, then we run KVM and double check it at the bytecode level, and that'll guard against bugs in the compiler and, um, and bugs in Verisol. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the, the plan for this assertion violation check. <clears throat> okay, fine. Uh, next is the bounded model checker, which is basically the symbolic version of this uh, runtime monitor. So this runtime monitor only exercises checks for violations in the runs of your tests, which are run on specific concrete inputs. Um, but you might want to know, is it possible there's violations in any runs of, of the program? And so to do that, we basically will just run the same test, but now on symbolic inputs instead, and then run the bounded model checker out to some specific depth and see if we can find a violation there. So it could be this example I have here is, uh, you know, it could be that the test only exercises cases where x is less than 3, in which case you go directly from this exact state to the no violation state because no overflow ever happens. But when x is greater than or equal to 3, you get this overflow, and then you get this end without a revert. Uh, which is a violation of this property. And so the, this wouldn't be caught by the runtime monitor because it only exercises the cases that are in your test set, but then we, here we would catch it and provide a counterexample saying, oh, try x is 7 or something like that. And then you would add that back to your test set and you wouldn't have to rerun this tool to find that violation. The next time you would just be part of your test set now. Okay, 
Sorry, I'm going so fast through this. Um, finally, the, the last tool that we're thinking of, of this is for each of these, I've said, you know, so once you find the violation, add a test back to your test set that uh, would catch it without having to rerun the tool, and that's to kind of speed up your later development process and, and to guard against um, other issues. Uh, but the very last tool we're planning on putting in Firefly is where we'll just generate that test for you. Um, so in the case of here, you know, we'll add for opcodes 12, 14, and 15, we'll do some analysis and find a test that will actually exercise that uh, particular, <coughs> those particular opcodes basically. Um, or here, you know, in the case where x greater than or equal to 3, we can ask the Microsoft tools, hey, give us an example of an x that's greater than or equal to 3. I know that's really easy to do, like seven or something, but sometimes it's harder, you know. And so then, uh, and then the tools can say, okay, here's, here's an assignment from variables that will exercise that particular um, execution panel. So that's the overall roadmap for Firefly at the moment. Um, I'm going to put up this roadmap again. You can see it kind of extends out a ways. Um, we are in this phase right now. Like I said, we have prototypes of all the tools going on here, not a test case generation. But we've given ourselves some time to really make sure that the everything's ironed out and works well. You know, we just want it to be basically drop-in. We want you. That's one of the goals: is users don't have to know that they're um, that they're using the tool until it tells them, "Hey, here's a problem." Okay, Gregory's going to wrap up. Um, Any questions for everyone? Um, yeah, you mentioned the, for the te um, for the test. You mentioned the case of the ABI. And then you could go back, uh, or uh, in general, if there's missing uh, test coverage, you can go back with the source mapping. Yeah, it may not be possible in all of, like that. You might have to actually craft some specific transaction with call data to exercise, yeah. like incorrect ABI encoding or something. Yeah, like no, but I'm also saying, like, um, so how are you experiencing this? Like, often source mapping for this kind of generated code doesn't give you any room for Yeah, so the source mapping would be more just to assist the developer. It wouldn't be used probably in the automated test generation because there we would just generate exactly the call data we need to feed in to to exercise that case. And for overflows, uh, in our uh, experience there's lots of overflows yeah. because the compiler likes to use them. Uh, in all kinds of cases, so do you have any filtering for that already, or? Well, so that's why you would you need the temporal property, which says like overflows are okay as long as they're followed by a revert in some case. Obviously, that's like a little too broad scope of a property, but you'd have. To I mean, because like sometimes the subtraction is optimized into like an addition with overflow and stuff like oh, okay. that. So, but yeah, we can yeah, have yeah. Yeah. figure it out. So you are going to have two backends, right? One. Those already exist, actually. That's just part of the case tool right now. I was just showing that's how the tooling is made right now. Um, so. uh, Go ahead. Which, uh, so I wanted to ask you about the two backends. Uh, after December 2020, why would you use the LLVM backend rather than the other one because of its speed? Or yeah, yeah. So, so we, the LLVM backend is basically you take the semantics and generate LLVM bit code that directly implements an interpreter for that language, but it can't do any symbolic execution. Um, but there's a lot of overhead in doing symbolic execution that uh, slows it down too much for actually making a reference interpreter or something like that. So, we have one minute left. So. Uh, one minute, but we have until 35. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was just going to say, I think it's important to note that uh, the technology is available, it works, we use it internally, uh, it's simply actually modifying and extending it out for, to, to make it further. So please note, please note this is not vaporware by any means, right? This so internally, is internally we already use the K framework for all these different variants of using the formal methods, formal verification, formal analysis. It's just that the tools require expert require us or others who have expertise in formal method. What we want to do literally is to leverage the capabilities of the tool through automation and make them available to everybody. And um, and automation comes from what we already do in our own audits when we analyze them, when we analyze people's code, we know that certain things can be automated. We already do that and that's what Firefly now as much as we can. And others come from the entire community, and especially from uh, from uh, all these uh, amazing tools that Microsoft uh, has and are under the hood in, uh, in very soft. So 
So key, the key word here is automation. And once the tools work, then we make them um, available to, to you as push button uh, analysis tools for your contacts. Oh, I also wanted to add, we are looking for, you know, people who are interested in conversing with us and being kind of alpha users in like a closed alpha sort of thing. So, grab at the conference if you want to be a part of that. Come to all the booths. Yeah. All right. So, again, I want to remind you that the K-Framework is language parametric or language agnostic. But none of the tools in the K-Framework care about what programming language you plug and play um, in these tools. And that gives us opportunities to do the same with many other languages. And we're already defining semantics for several lang other languages, which will all take advantage of the tools that we support and we improve right now as, uh, as part of Firefly and, uh, and this uh, uh, integration with Redis. Um, among other, besides uh, WASL, we're also working on several other languages. Maybe on interesting languages flow based on, uh, on linear types and resource system like, uh, like Move. And, and then um, you have out of the board for analysis tools for this language. Once you define them for one semantic, to incentivize people to formalize their languages in K, and thanks to the LLVM interpretation, which is pretty fast, you can think of it as you implement your language in K. And if you are happy with the speed, then you may not even need another implementation. Work with some customers who say that, hey, I think that speed is good enough actually for us. We don't even need to implement, uh, to have an output implementation of the language. Um, also, somebody asked about um, uh, protocols, if you want to, to formalize and analyze specific protocols. Yes, this is another advantage of the K framework, that it doesn't even care whether what you are defining is a programming language or not, or is computer to have a notion of transition from one state to another. And once you formalize that, and that can be in particular a protocol or a token specification, once you do that, then you can use, again, all the tools of the K framework to analyze your, uh, your, uh, your protocols or tokens. And we're already doing it uh, commercially. Uh, we have uh, formalized and analyzed several protocols. Um, um, actually, right now we're working with Vlad uh, Samshin, right there, on Casper CBC. <laughs> yes, and um, also the Beacon Chain. And all of these become, you can think of K at that moment as a programming language. You say, hey, I'm implementing my protocol in K. Uh, and then you can execute and run things the same as you would implement them and run them with Python or Go. Uh, but at the same time, you can also formally analyze them, exactly the, as they are, without uh, any gap between what you run and what you verify. And with this, we'd like to conclude. And if you like that, we'll, what we saw, we strongly encourage you to attend the three other events that uh, I'm aware of, that mentioned K, in the, or uh, led to K in, uh, in DEF CON 5. Um, come to our booth downstairs, get a t-shirt, stickers, go to the K website, K-Framework and GitHub K-Framework. Uh, there are lots of languages defined, for example, K-Framework and K-Framework. Um, not only EVM, several others. The Firefly tool is uh, available for download. Download, play with it, and uh, become an alpha test tester. Uh, very soon, also free for download. And uh, if you really like to have the base of formal verification, but you do not want to do it yourself, we are here to help. Uh, contact us with our tools, and uh, we'll help you. Uh, formally verify your contracts or tokens or protocols. And we have a few minutes for questions. One minute left. <laughs> now a real one minute. Um, yes? What about Rust? Rust is a programming language. Yeah. If, if we have a formal semantics. Yeah. There, is, there are two formal semantics defined by other groups, not by us. Um, and we don't know how good they are. We haven't played with them, we haven't looked at them, but there are two semantics. One of them for sure defined in their safe uh, fragment um, of Rust. But we are working on verifying some WASM code that was generated from Rust, for instance. So that's also worth And you can define your language yourself. You don't have to. Um, I mean, there are lots of examples. And, uh, and I, we believe that all the tools that K provides incentivize people to formalize their language. Uh, so I have a question. Yes. If we don't have access to the formal uh, verification in space, uh, for me, I'm just like, uh, like a general <coughs> right. okay. um, What kind of practice we can apply in our daily coding? So that's why Firefly is supposed to be. Firefly will be a tool that encapsulates under the hood all the automation of the game framework. But then we need to formally specify the property. <coughs> and that's unavoidable. That's either you need to learn or work with other people. 
the what we do is part of part of our audit. More than half the time in an audit, we spend with the customer understanding their their properties to help them formalize the specifications of their properties. Yeah, but I want to know what are some like low hanging things we can pick up. Uh, for example, uh, nowadays, I guess a lot of programmers use uh, testing, especially like yes. prompt, prompt in, uh, checking or prompt testing. Yes. Can we uh, use some of the tools? Yeah, file to, file file to do that. I mean, we don't need to spend too much time to yes. uh, change the way we code it, but we can do it. Exactly. That's why we want to have file, right? Exactly for, for uh, Does it mean that, because you say that the testing could be automatic, does it mean that uh, we don't really need to write... Uh, no, you, still, you still need to write tests to get execution traces for prior flooding. So. But the point is that now you can get more out of writing your tests would be the idea. I mean, there's some work that's unavoidable. You need to somehow tell it, this is what I want my contract to do, either in the form of tests or in the form of formal specification, which is more exhaustive. But. And for example, if you're working with Solidity, if you have assertions of the in Solidity, try very soft. Tell the tool what you want. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I just want to know.